I'm so glad and happy that it's obvious that you came to have church and not watch church. Bless the name of the Lord. We thank God for our vessels and young adult combined chorus and angelic voices. It's a beautiful thing when the family comes together. Thank God for all of you that came to worship with us today. Some came from near, some came from far. I think there's some Carolina folk in the house. Can I get a shout out for the Carolina crew? All the way up 95 and 85 to be a part of this great day of celebration. Thank God for all of those that continue to worship with us through our live stream. We thank God for you and consider you to be a vibrant part of our church with our walls. Be so kind, if you will, for a few blessed moments to meet me in Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah the eagle-eyed prophet gives us a word of encouragement in chapter 64, beginning at verse 1. All those that are able to stand in honor of God's holy word, please join us at this time. If you cannot stand, we pray with us and we do understand. I like the way Isaiah begins this 64th chapter with the word, oh, tells us something exciting is about to happen. Let's read together prayerfully. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causes the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things which we looked not for, thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee what he hath prepared for him that waited for him. Thou meetest them that rejoices and work in righteousness, those that remember thee in thy ways. Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned, and those is continuous, and we shall be saved. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee, for thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou our potter, and we are all the work of thy hand. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his holy word. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for this, another blessed opportunity to come together and worship your name with the body of Christ. Oh, that your Holy Spirit would continue to rule and reign in this service, that your word would go forth from your servants to uplift the spirits of your people. And we will be careful and prayerful to give your name all the honor and the glory, because truly it all belongs to you. It's in that mighty, powerful, resurrected, restoring name of Jesus that we pray, and all of God's people said, Amen, and bless the Lord. Thank you for praying with us as we continue to seek God for the fires of revival. The fires of revival. Would you not agree that our nation and the world is in grave need of revival? Wars and rumors of wars, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, mass shootings are all a sign to tell us emphatically that we need the fires of revival. Isaiah, the eagle-eyed prophet, worked in political realms for over 40 years, but never compromised his witness. His very name means Jehovah is salvation. Augustine, the African bishop of Hippo, said that Isaiah is like the fifth gospel because the plan of salvation is laid out so clearly he also is called the Shakespeare of the Old Testament because he often writes in glaring and blazing poetic terms. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah speaks of law and judgment, but the second half speaks of love and grace. He combines, as it were, the Old and New Testament in the different dispensation. And so we come to this blessed point in time. Oh, that thou wouldest rend or break the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. What it's really saying is that hallelujah, revivals of fire. 
He's asking God to come down and really pour out his spirit. Deuteronomy 4.29 and Jeremiah 29.13 say these words. When we see God with our whole heart, we'll find him. Psalm 9, one further goes to say we should praise God with our whole heart. Time out for half-hearted praise. Time out for half-hearted worship. Time out for half-hearted works. God wants all of you and he wants all of me. Oh, that God would send down revival. It tells the point that Matthew 22, 37 tells us that we should love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and with all of our mind. It's been said before by one of our wise, gifted, anointed deacons that the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. See, when we seek God's face, Aaron Rodgers, the old anointed preacher from Southern Baptist, said that we want God to do this for us and to do that for us. That's seeking God's hand. But when we move beyond just seeking God's hand and fall on our face before God and seek God's face, then God will show up and he will even show out. Oh, that God would send down revival. The Bible says in Matthew they that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. When Christ exceeds culture, when prayer receives profit, and materialism receives the Messiah, we are moving in the right direction. The Bible even tells us that we should set our affections on things which are above. As a loving, caring, hardworking people, we are often more preoccupied with the temporal and forget to reflect and focus on the eternal. You do know this world is coming to an end. I can't imagine hard to wrap my mind around the fact that some folk this time last week had nice houses, nice cars. The Bahamas, the paradise now looks more like an apocalyptic has come by. But here we are, have our houses, have our cars, reasonable portion of health and strength, and we can't give God praise, and we don't want God to revive us again. Matter of fact, Psalm 85, but verse 5 says, Will thou not revive us again, that the people may rejoice? There's too much heartache, there's too much pain, too much devastation, too much despair. Philippians 4, 4 said, Rejoice in the Lord, and again I say rejoice. When we cry out to God and put God first, not on the back burner, but on the forefront of all of our lives, Cry out like Paul when he said, Oh, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, that I might be made conformable unto his death, even the life of Jesus Christ. When God becomes first again, revival will break out. When we want more of Jesus than we do more of anything else. I believe Mark says, chapter 8, what shall it profit a man, woman, boy, or girl if I gain the whole world and lose my soul? When ethics trump economics, when prayer is put before politics, when Christ comes before Congress, revival will begin to break out. When we seek the Lord, the psalmist said in Psalm 42, Oh, my heart, Panted for thee, like a hot red male mountain deer panted for a stream. The hot H A R T is a red male mountain deer. He lives in high places. And if I could use my sanctified imagination for just a little while, when the male deer seeks the living water, I see Mrs. Deer and little deer following behind. Because we get a Joshua spirit, 24, 15 says, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. When the husband and the father desire revival and spiritual breakthroughs, then revival will come in a way. The fires of revival. Revive us again, O oh Lord. Fill us with your spirit. Oh, that thou wouldest come down. He already sent his son. He already sent the Holy Spirit. So he's already here. And the Bible says it this way. God has given us all that we need pertaining to godliness and righteousness. We just got to stir up the gift. When truth trumps fake news, revival begins in our hearts. We're praying that revival will break out in the house of God. We are blessed to have some sophisticated academicians, members, parishioners at the Fort Foot Baptist Congregation. 
But I come to learn that no matter how sophisticated you are, may have obtained erudite, unique, special subject matter experts, when fire touches you, you are going to move. Hallelujah. When fire touches you, it's going to be hard just to be silent. We're talking about the fire of the Holy Ghost. Oh, that Pentecost would break out in the house of God. Holiness ought not be just a denomination. It should be a way of life for every child of God. Oh, that thou would break through from the heavens and come down, that the mountains will melt before you. And when the melting of the fire burneth, the fire causes the water to boil. I like the way this is recorded in the New American Standard. It said, when the fire burneth the brushwood. Oh, I'm trying to go somewhere in a minute. See, I did some study on woodology. There's some expensive pressure-treated woods. One is the Dow Bergia. The second is the pink ivory. The third is the ebony. The fourth is sandalwood. The fifth, bless the name of Jesus, is African blackwood. But the psalmist said, you don't have to be expensive prime time pressure treated wood. Just be the brushwood and let the brushwood catch on fire. You ain't got to have a PhD. You ain't got to have a doctor degree. You don't have to have status and rank in society. Just be committed, dedicated brushwood, but be more than committed, dedicated brushwood. When you catch on fire, everything begins to burn. You do know the Bibles have some temperatures. The word of God says this way, sadly, there come a time when men and women and boys and girls will wax cold spiritually. They won't see the need to worship. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 gives me evidence. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says this. Satan, the God of this age, the God of this eon, the God of this time frame in which we live, has blinded their mind so they cannot see the glorious light of the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. They start saying things like, you don't really have to worship. They're talking about, I'm my own sinner of God. There's a higher power. We start talking about the man upstairs. He's downstairs also. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. His Old Testament name was Jehovah. The word Jehovah was so sacred, they didn't write it nor say it because they worshiped and honored and reverenced God so mightily that they didn't even want to say the word. Jehovah means he is eternal self-existent. Jehovah means he's the creator of everything and everybody and the sustainer of everything and everybody. Yet he himself was created by no one, nor is he sustained by anyone. He's Jehovah. Jehovah also means that there never was or was when God was not. Neither is there a moment when he is not, nor shall there ever be a time when he seems to be. He's God all by himself. And he says, I believe in Isaiah 46, and my glory will I not share with another. Pray for our country. Pray for the president when he starts talking about he's the chosen one. He is not the chosen one. There's only one chosen one. His name is Jesus. He's the chosen one. He's the savior of the world. Oh, that God would send revival. We want to take the name of God out of everything that's spiritual. The Bible says it this way. Blessed is a nation whose God is Jehovah. We say we are a Christian nation, and we are in theory, but the sad reality tells us emphatically over and over that we are more of a pagan nation in practice. In God we trust. No, we trust the green stamp that those words are printed upon. But I believe by faith, Revival followed by the breakout in here. When revival breaks out, sinners get saved. When revival breaks out, saints get edified and encouraged. When revival breaks out, above all, God is magnified. I am not the center of attention. You are not the center of emphasis here. Jesus is the main attraction for he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw. 
There's no other name under heaven whereby you must be saved. Oh, but at the name of Jesus. How many know kings and kingdoms will all pass away? Oh, but there's something about that name. Do you not know there's joy in that name? There's healing in the name of Jesus. There's forgiveness in the name of Jesus. There's restoration in the name of Jesus. Oh, there's power. There's peace. There's deliverance. Who is this king? He's the king of glory. Strong and mighty. Who is this king? His name is Jesus. I got to keep moving. There's about to be an explosive revival here in a minute. When a fire comes down from the melted mountains, can I make a quick chance? Hermeneutical transfer. Thank you, preachers. What's so big about a mountain melting? That's physical, but can I go spiritual for a moment? When the mountains of pride in your life and my life get melted down before God, when the mountain of self-sufficiency gets melted down to depend and rely on God, he said, I'm a very present help in a time of trouble. When the mountain of trouble in your life gets melted down and you give it over to God, you cast all your cares on the Lord. When the mountains of racism are no longer there, when the mountains of pride and despair stop cluttering our ways, Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction, a haughty, arrogant spirit before the fall. Can I go one step further? Psalm 73, 6. Psalm 73, 6 says, Pride chokes you like a chain. The more pride you get. I realize the whole hymn of the church is true. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Every hour. Every minute. Every second. Matter of fact, John makes it clear. Without him, we can do nothing. Revival in church is not just for old folk. All of us need revival. God, I need you to revive my mind so I'll think on the things that are pleasing in your sight. God, I need you to revive my hand so my work will be pleasing in your sight. God, I sure need you to revive my heart so I'll love the things that you love. I'll follow Matthew 22, 37 to love God with all of my heart, all of my soul, and all of my mind so that no one or nothing ever gets put before God. When my heart is revived, I love difficult folk. I'll forgive mean can take them as crunchy folk. When my heart is revived, he gives me compassion. I become more loving than legal, more joy than judgmental. Go, God, touch my heart. The Bible even gives us hope. He says, some of your hearts are like stone. Give me your heart of stone. It's so hard, you can engrave on it. I'll give you a heart of flesh that'll start loving folk that you didn't used to like. You'll start helping folk that you wouldn't want to help. You have the gift of mercy, not the spirit of meanness. God just touched my heart. So I'll reach out and share the good news of Jesus Christ. Though you may be down in a valley, he'll pick you up. Psalm 3.3 3 says, he's the lifter up of a bow down head. When my heart gets right and I start loving folk, it becomes a very powerful magnetic force to draw folk to Jesus Christ. That our lights would so shine that they would see not your glory and my glory, but our lights would so shine that they would see the love of Jesus Christ. Oh God, send revival. Let it begin in you. Let it begin in me. The fire, the text says here in verse 2, calls the water to boil. Some have waxed cold. Some Christians have not waxing cold. But we are lukewarm, Revelation chapter 3. We say, I don't sin as much as they do. I pray sometimes. I read my Bible occasionally. I help every now and then when it's convenient. Might be lukewarm. And Jesus said, you don't like lukewarm coffee. You don't like lukewarm products that should be hot. He said, matter of fact, you're so lukewarm, you make me nauseated. Spare me your half-hearted praise. I didn't send one of the apostles to die for you. I gave you the very best that I had. Since God gave us the best that he had, it's the least we can do is give God our best. Like Paul said, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of Jesus Christ. 
God, here is my cup. Fill me for your service. Spill me in your service. Then fill me for your service again and spill me in your service. One family was at the restaurant and they became quite perturbed. He was expecting some pouring of java in his cup. Finally, the waitress came by and said, sir, you appear to be quite disturbed and perturbed. He said, yes, the service around here is so poor. I can't wait to fill out your bad evaluation. She said, sir, no disrespect, but your cup was turned down. Child of God, what are you saying? If our spiritual cups have been turned down, then we're not allowing God to fill it. God, turn my cup up so I can hear your voice. Turn my heart up so I can hear what thus said the Lord, that I might walk in a manner that brings honor and glory. The call came in from Comcast, Direct TV. They said, I paid money for this service. I got a 10-year warranty. I'm only in 2019, year five, and this thing is not functioning properly. So the service person showed up within the two-hour time window that they should, and they promised. He said, ma'am, when this tree was planted, it was like a little shrub. But now that it has grown up, it is blocking your signal. There's nothing wrong with the radar and the antenna. This tree is now blocking the signal. Is there anything in your life, in my life, that's blocking God's signal? Because God's trying to speak a word to you. He's trying to give a word of encouragement, but you got so much stuff in your life, it's blocking God's signal. And it's, when he puts, trying to send a word to you, he's saying, access denied. But if you would pray and ask God for revival and remove the distractions and remove the obstacles, he'll send the word to give you courage in your heart. You'll say, you know what? I'm not going to fail. I'm more than a conqueror because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I am an overcomer for the God that I serve is able to do all things. What? Does God need to do in your life to fan the flame of revival? Some of you are good cooks and chefs. There's some foods that cannot be cooked properly until the water starts to boil. Any, any chefs in the house? Any wannabe chefs, part-time chefs? All look like you've been eating quite well, so somebody's cooking. But the point he says here, when the fire comes down, 2 Chronicles 6 is calling my name for a moment. When they prayed, not if, but when they prayed, God sent down the fire. Call on the name of the Lord. Now, I'm not talking about your little cute prayer that you memorized all week to show us how loquacious and eloquent you are. I'm talking about a prayer that emanates out of the depths of your heart when you cry out to God because you almost felt like you were on the verge of a spiritual breakdown but realize you were on the verge of a spiritual breakthrough and you cried out to God sometimes you can't pray to God cute you got to get ugly for Jesus don't matter if your mess up me mascara gets messed up your tie gets crooked you better mean business from God because you're not praying to impress folk One prime time deacon was praying some time ago. One member made a mistake, said, I couldn't hear you when you pray. He said, I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to God. Amen. Proverbs 15, 29 said, God is far from the wicked. All oh, but hear it, the prayers of the righteous. Young, middle, old, prime time. When you cry out to God from a sincere heart, God hears your prayer. You may not have a large, extensive vocabulary, but when the words come from your heart and you are sincere, it blesses the name of Jesus. God will show up. God, I'm young, but I got problems. God, I'm concerned. God, I'm conflicted. God, I'm confused. God hears your prayer. He'll show up. When the fire got hot, the water started boiling. Are you praying with me? You can't have a hard-boiled egg if the water's not hot. Your clothes are all wrinkled because the dryer's not hot. 
something wrong in the element. It won't get hot. When God checks the spiritual element of foot, foot, why is it that we are a wrinkle? He said, I'm not coming back for a wrinkle church. I'm coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. So it's got to get hot up in here to the boiling point. What's the boiling temperature for water? I hear two something. Hundred. Scientists said 212. If it's at 180, it's warm, but it's not a boiling. Here's what I'm getting to. We want the Holy Spirit to be boiling up in us. Bubbling over. My wife said, husband, watch the pot. When it starts boiling, call me. I said, baby, it's boiling. It's about to boil over. Somebody ought to see your life and my life. And say, They're not waxing cold. They're not lukewarm. That temperature is approaching boiling point for Jesus Christ. And when stuff stop boiling, it gets to cooking. The fire calls the water to boil, number two. And then the third explosion here is that when the fire of the Holy Spirit comes down, things start boiling. Young folk show up in church. Don't, 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 don't get fooled. Don't get bamboozled. While you spend a lot of time on Facebook, when the fire comes and the water starts boiling, you'll not spend all your time on Facebook. you get your face in the book. Hmm. Hmm. All your time is not on your iPhone. It is I, oh Lord. I'm standing in the need of prayer. It's not my mother. It's not my father. Oh, but it's me, oh Lord. I'm standing in the need of prayer. What's God use you in your school? What's God use you in your workplace? What's God make you a bright light in your... What's God show up? Use you for his glory. It's boiling. Not only will the water begin to boil and things start cooking, the text says here that we make his name known to his adversaries. Evangelism 101 assignment. Tell your neighbors two to three houses down this week something good about Jesus. See, some of us don't know our neighbors two to three houses down. Even though we've been living there for a number of years, we are too private about our worship. Acts 1.8 says, after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, hometown, Judea, close by, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. If we are not God's witnesses, what are we doing? I hope and pray every person that lost their life in the Bahamas knew the Lord. What are you saying, Pastor? We are often sometimes too casual about our Christianity as if we got all the time in the world. And I'm asking God, how long are you going to tolerate us? How long are you going to put up with our foolishness and madness and ungodly ways? How long? So the point I'm trying to get to real quick is that we need to develop a spiritual urgency. Help us, parents, young folk living in your house, eating up all your food, wearing clothes that you bought, and decide they want to sleep in and don't want to do worship. While I'm paying your blue cross and blue shield, I'm paying your car insurance. I bought them hundred dollar sneakers you're wearing. So to help them in love. Come on, Dad. You can't say y'all be safe on the way to church. No, I ain't no y'all be safe on the way to church. Come on, Joshua 24, 15, man. As for me in my house, be like Dick and Chris Manning in love. As for me in my house, we'll serve the Lord. Be like Dick and Richard Curtin. Be like men that say, wait a minute. By example, there was a wise priest who said, preach everywhere you go. Use words when necessary. We are living epistles read of all men by the life we live. Brother Troy asks you, got all the triplets falling behind and the lovely wife. We 
that his name might be known to the adversaries and the nations might tremble. Moving quickly. Verse 3 says, when New Americans stand it, when thou didst awesome things that we didn't expect, when revival breaks out, God will do some unexpected, unusual, powerful things. God said, don't put me in a box. There's a scripture that says, I believe it's in Chronicles. Help me out, Reverend Norman. The men of Issachar were aware of their times. We're never going to change God's message. It is true. But we might have some unique creative methodologies to try to reach God's people in this age in which we live. We got a glimpse of it back in New Year's evening. I believe his name is Chris Manning Jr., a.k.a. CJ, came with a new youthful young adult praise and got us moving. All of us, brushwood, need to help with the fire. You need some prime time, mature, seasoned saint wood. It's been dry, now it's seasoned. Some wood, you cut it, it's fresh green. It burns slow. But once the green wood is set aside and it dries, then it's ready to burn. Down the country, we call it kindling. Somebody from Carolina had to make the fire. That kindling wood was chopped slim, sliced so that when it got in the fire, it didn't take long to ignite and to get warm in the house. Nothing worse than a cold house in the winter time. If you don't like a cold house, why you want a cold church? Some of the church that went to sleep, pastor said, Brother Price, wake that man up. He said, no disrespect, pastor. You put him to sleep, you wake him up. <laughs> don't nobody want no cold preacher. In a cold church, we want some fire. We want a Jeremiah syndrome. Jeremiah said, my preaching as of the oracles of God, I hope it would bring inspiration, but for me, it brought incarceration. And so because it brought incarceration and no inspiration that was visible, I'm going to sit down on God. I ain't going to preach no more. I ain't going to say what God says. I'm going to give them nice words that make them feel good because I don't want to be ostracized. I'm going to sit down on God. I'm going to let my preaching and teaching anointing just go cold. He said, I tried that for a while, but all after a while, something starts auctioning on the inside. It was like fire shut up in my bones. I couldn't keep it. I got to tell somebody about the love of Jesus Christ. No matter how far down you may be, no matter how broken, no matter how bent, no matter how distraught, no matter how devastated, God is able. If he has to reach way down, he'll pick you up put joy in your heart, give you a song that the angels cannot sing. You said, I've been redeemed. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. All of my sins have been forgiven because Jesus paid it all. I know I'm speaking truth to power because there was a time in my life I was sinking deep in my sin. I was far from the priest of shore, badly stained and bruised it in. Didn't think I'd ever rise no more. All but the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters lifting me. Oh, now safe am I. Now I got a song that the angels just cannot sing. I've been redeemed. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. All of my sins have been forgiven because Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. Oh, but he washed it. Oh, but he washed it. Won't he make you clean inside? I got the joy of the Lord. I got the joy that the world didn't give me. I got a peace that the world can't take away all in his mind. I'm going to tell it as long as there's air in my lungs, long as there's blood in my veins, I'm going to lift up the name of Jesus. For he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men. I'm the savior of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Tell them lies I came not to condemn the world but that the world might be saved. God, I thank you for the revival. Light a fire, light a torch in my heart so men and women that are dead in spirit will come alive. Lord, send revival. He closes by saying, God, Father, I acknowledge your sovereignty. I am but clay. You are the potter. Not only am I a clay pot, I'm a clay, clay pot with cracks on it. God, I'm just a crack pot. But if you can use a crack pot for your glory, 
because I'm glad that the blood of Jesus covers up my cracks. The blood of Jesus covers up my scars. Blood of Jesus covers up my wounds. He puts me in the fire, in the kettle of salvation and sanctification. When I come forth like pure gold, they won't see my scars. I'll be a vessel of honor. God, I give your name glory. God, I honor your name. I magnify your name. Oh, come on, church, as I close. Worship the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Oh, magnify the Lord. He's worthy. He's worthy. All of the glory, all of the honor, it belongs to him. Long as I can, one glad morning, when this life is over, I want to see those eyes that look like balls of fire. I want to see that hair look like lamb's wool. I want to see those feet that look like polished brass as that they've been burned in the furnace. I want him to say, servants of God, well done. You've been faithful over a few things. Why don't you sit down and rest a little while? One glad morning, all of my trials, all of my cares, they'll be over. Every day going to be Sunday. South going to have no end. It'll be glory, glory, hallelujah. Every now and then I feel like heaven come down and glory fill my soul when I think of the goodness of the Lord and all that is done for me. My soul cries out, glory, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I love to call your name. Or oh, there's something about that name makes me say, yeah, he's all right. He's all right. God, I thank you for the revival. He said, you got to stir up yourself. Some folks said, I'm leaving the church. Pastor ain't feeding me. You grown now. You ought to better eat a little bit on your own. If you only eat once a week, you'll be malnourished. You got to feed yourself with the word of God on Sunday. Feed yourself with the word of God on Monday. Feed yourself with the word of God on Tuesday. Feed yourself with prayer on Thursday. You ought to have a good Friday and a sanctified Saturday. You ought to eat by yourself. And then when we come together for the spiritual banquet, praise will break out. The limits will break out. I'm going to leave y'all alone. But the Lord been so good. He been better to me than I could have been to myself. I just got to give him glory. I got to give him praise. All that is done for you, all that is done for me. I'm trying to stop right now, but there's something on the inside. Working on the outside, bring about a revival in me. I just want to say, yeah, yeah, it's all right. Ain't the Lord all right? Ain't he all, all right? Uh, woke me up this morning, started me on my way. Yeah, I can wave my hand. Let's stand. Oh, yeah. He's all right. Ain't he all right? Ain't the Lord all right now? Oh, God, be praised. In the morning, praise him in the noonday. In the evening time. Stir up. Stir up. Stir up. For his glory. If you're here today and don't know Jesus. His precious gift of salvation is available. He died on a cross. Resurrected early one Sunday morning. That's why we come to worship because every Sunday we re-celebrate the resurrection. If you're here today and don't know Jesus Christ, the old preacher said it's getting late in the evening and the sun has gone down. We need to be in a hurry to come to know Jesus Christ. He not only revives, he resurrects. Bible said we were dead in sin yet now has he quickened Come on, baby. the Bible says except you come as a little child you won't even see the kingdom if a little child has enough presence of God to come to Jesus how about you, my? 
brothers and sisters. What's your name? Talia, welcome. Love you. Bless you. Will there be others today? Welcome home, my sister. Angela Stevenson's welcome home. Will there be others today? 1 John 1, 9 says that we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't let this moment pass. Too much is going on in our world. Some say you're here today and gone tomorrow. You can be here today and gone today. <laughs> The spiritual man says the meteorologist can read the clouds, tell us what category the hurricane is, but can't read the sign of the times. Time to be saved is now. The Bible says the day you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart. Would there be others here today who have never given their life to Jesus Christ? I hear somebody saying non-verbally, I've been in the church for the last 15 years, and that's good. Right now, I'm not talking about being in the church. I'm talking about, are you in Christ? The Bible says, Marva, not I say unto you, you must be born again. Have you made that great life decision?